Hello. Our story begins inside the Nightside Space Station outside of the Thalzar system in the year 21 ABY. The war with the Empire was seemingly over, and yet out here, far away from the capital of the New Republic, were the seeds of a war that echoed the Republic's coming destruction. While minuscule in scale, the hunt for Rey was one that could redefine the coming Empire. It was through Ochia Bastoon, an old Sith hunter, that her grandfather was searching for her. Ochi had a long history of being arrogant, due to his ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jedi throughout the Clone Wars, even including the likes of Depa Balaba and her former instructor, Mace Windu. He was here now, after years of little work, looking for the key to returning to his true master. His instructions were simple, bring the girl to Palpatine. He had tracked her to Nightside, as he had been trailing the sun for a long while. Dathan Palpatine was a Strandcast clone, created with no sensitivity to the Force, as was common with clones. Rey was what Palpatine wanted, because the genes from him had transferred down a generation, and her mother's own sensitivity, limited albeit, assisted with creating a child of incredible potential. Ochi had used his contacts at Nightside to trap the family, of three, who were on the run. Tragically for the two parents, Miramar and Dathan, they had trusted a New Republic pilot who had sent them here. It wasn't in vain, but the Republic didn't believe in these superstitions from the unknown regions, and they didn't treat refugees much differently. The pilot had done all she could, but it just wasn't enough. The administrator of Nightside, named Zargo and Axminer, had tricked the family and trapped them inside of his luxury space yacht. They didn't have access to the control fob, and they couldn't escape, thanks to armed sentries outside the ship itself and the locked door. Everything was set up so Ochi could come through and make his side of the deal. However, things played out a little differently when Ochi brought his droid crush pirates of Bastoon to run a distraction for him. In a move to double cross Zargo, he tried to find the Goldstone so he could get the family and get to his master. As it turns out, Lando Calrissian and his friend, Luke Skywalker, were also in Nightside. Ochi had been a bit of a drunkard, especially since it was hard to find work as a Sith hunter in an era of no known Sith. Lando had overheard Ochi when he was at Senefer's Beam and Balance Cantina. Poor Calrissian had lost his daughter, Kadera, and had tracked her across the galaxy and yet never found her. He had stepped down and retired away from the New Republic military to find her. Hearing about this girl, Rey, and of course the Sith, brought he and Luke out here. While Lando was concerned with the Republic and the fight against evil, his number one priority right now was with the family of three and this little girl. Maybe it was his daughter, maybe it wasn't, but he knew in his heart that no matter who it was, he wouldn't allow the same thing that happened to his daughter happen to her. He and Luke were running through the halls with R2 when blaster fire started to erupt. Sentries and pirate droids blasted at each other, causing a disruption for the two friends as they closed in on the hangar bay that housed the Goldstone. Due to this, it gave time for Miramar, a mechanic of sorts, to rummage through the interior compartment inside the cockpit. She had found the spark plugs and was trying to ignite the engine. Ray was sleeping on one of the chairs in the cockpit, and Dathan was helping as much as he could. Having been born on Exegol, he would be the perfect guide for Luke. After all, it was Luke's own father who unknowingly saved the child of Palpatine from that hard land. Blaster fire could be heard echoing outside as Miramar jumped out of the engines on the Goldstone, and as she readied herself to take a hold over the vessel's control yoke, thunderous boots could be heard. They feared of Ochi, they worried of Zargo, and they hoped that it was the New Republic pilot's contact. Tragically, it was none of the above. The guard stationed on the outside of the ship heard the engines kick on, and they quickly moved into the vessel to make sure this valuable family didn't escape. Dathan covered the doorway with his body as a blaster shot filled his chest, and he stumbled to the ground, landing with a thud. Miramar moved to shield her daughter from the sight that would echo the sound of the ringing of the blaster. The droids pointed their weapons forward and prepared to fire at the two of them, specifically the mother. Zargo only needed the daughter, so neither of the parents were of a concern to them. As Miramar tried to convince the programmed droids to leave them alone, their boots scuttled across the floor as the hissing of an electrified weapon caught both her and her daughter's attention. The hissing was followed with a couple swift and decisive strikes. Miramar placed her palm over Ray's eyes to make sure she didn't see anything horrendous. The first man into the room had a very prestigious mustache as his focus went straight to Dathan to check for a pulse. Miramar watched them closely before her eyes landed on a middle-aged man with a thick beard and a deep black Jedi robe. He looked first to Lando, who shook his head, then to Miramar, and told her that they were from the New Republic, and they were here to protect them. 
Lando got up and placed himself in front of the father's body, as mother and daughter were quickly removed from the vessel. Luke requested that Lando take them back to Lady Luck. He'd find the Sith Hunter and deal with them first. Lando nodded without hesitation and left. Miramar held Rey in her arms, despite her becoming very heavy at the age of six, and they ran through Nightside, avoiding the still raging skirmish. Skywalker moved around the hangar of the Goldstone, where he would cut down a number of Ochi's parrot droids, before coming across another foe. As it turns out, Luke was also looking for someone else, someone he had a vision of. Skywalker reached out to a Pintoran woman named Kiza. She was a loyalist to the Acolytes of Beyond, but her hatred was fueled by the mask she wore. It belonged to a Sith Lord known as Vicera Exum Pinchard. The mask itself contained the screams of a hundred slaughtered innocents. It was through their pain that the Vicera was able to maintain such a firm connection to the mask. Kiza was simply a pawn on Pinchard. She was searching for Exegol as well, so that the new era of Sith could be reborn. Luke, to a very basic degree, knew she wasn't a Sith, and refused to fight her. But, as he had learned with Sidious on the Death Star, at some point he'd have to fight back. Kiza ignited a Sith weapon and swung at the Jedi Master viciously. He stepped back, using his hands to parry her strikes and throw her loose swings into the walls. While there were no set forms for Skywalker, he was able to master what was at his disposal. As Kiza got closer and closer to landing a strike, Luke used a force to throw her backwards. She tumbled across the ground and when she got up, the mask screamed through her ears. Luke could see Kaiza inside the mask, clinging on the life, but she couldn't escape the curse of the Sith. Before she could truly listen to what Luke was saying to her, she was pushed aside by Ochia Bastoon. The overconfident Sith hunter prided himself, believing that Luke wouldn't stand a chance. He pumped his chest, feeling a high after taking the life of Zargo. In his hand was a Sith dagger, one Ochi planned on using to help him get to Exegol. The dagger itself was a curse like the Viceroy's mask, but when the dagger took life, it drank from its victims, and the user felt the rush of such a thrilling kill. This is where Ochi was, in the thrill. He told Luke that he had fought Clone Wars Jedi, and he had claimed victory against them. Luke smiled to himself as he released his blade from his belt and ignited it. The emerald glow illuminated the hallway as Ochi ran forward before whipping out his blaster and firing at the Jedi Master. Luke blocked the shots as Ochi got close to him and jumped forward. Luke grabbed Ochi's wrist and twisted it back before swinging his lightsaber around. The old assassin from Bastoon dipped his hips back, and right before Luke could finish his counter, Kaiza swung at him. Luke ducked, throwing an elbow into her abdomen before spinning away from the Sith dagger that clipped Kaiza. Luke stepped away, feeling the radiating darkness from the blade. It was thirsty, but how could a blade be thirsty? Luke watched the blade and then his eyes drifted to Kaiza, who held her cut with her bare hand. Ochi launched himself at the Jedi, and before he could reach him, Kaiza lobbed her lightsaber right through Ochi's back, and he wheezed in pain, falling to his knees as he did. Kaiza ripped his head off with one swift strike, before grabbing the dagger and jabbing at Luke, who dodged it, accidentally clipping the blade as he did, before swinging back and parrying at the right point of attack, shoving her back and cutting her down. As the mask fell off of her head, he looked down shamefully. There was almost a freeing expression in her eyes, like he had saved her from the Sith. With the dagger cut up, it would take more time to uncover its secrets, but Luke knew it was time to go. By the time he returned, Lando was talking to Rey kindly, while Miramar was trying to figure out how to fully grasp her own emotions around the event. Lando was really good at distracting Rey, especially because she was marveled by his silky cape. Luke went to the cockpit it took off leading the ship out of the nightside space station and departing into hyperspace. There would be a lot of explaining, but thanks to Lando and Luke, they were able to get Rey to a safe location within the core, though there remained conversation to be had with Miramar privately. They were able to have it once Rey fell asleep, but Luke had learned who Dathan was, and as a Jedi, he was hell-bent on finding the secrets of the Sith, and he wanted Lando to come with, but he didn't seem as eager as he was at the moment. Miramar wanted revenge, and so... There was a little deal that could be made here. Being that Dathan had told her most of his secrets, she could help Luke with his expedition to find Exegol. This did leave Miramar in a bind, and she wasn't one to just trust anyone. But through her conversation with Luke, she fully understood why Lando was able to communicate with Rey so easily. There was something both Rey and Lando needed right now, and Miramar understood that in a weird way, it was each other. The father-daughter bond had been broken by Dathan's death and Kadara's disappearance. With Lor Senteca watching over the Jedi Temple on Osis, 
Luke had some time to find the Sith planet. Rey was safe. To Mir Mar, that was all that mattered. With Lando staying with Rey on Chandrilia for the time being, after about a week of comfort, Luke and Miramar would begin their journey. Rey had a very hard time understanding how her father was killed. All she knew is there was a really loud ringing and her eyes were covered in the black shadow of her mother's back. Thanks to the week of preparation, Luke was able to relieve Lor Senteca for a couple days as he informed him and the temple about the coming journey. He'd be bringing his friend Ezra to watch over the temple grounds when Lor wasn't around. Ezra loved it because he could instill rambunctious habits into the family of Jedi. On Chandrilla, Rey would get the chance to meet Chewie, Leia, and Han through various occasions. While Lando didn't live here full time, he wasn't going to bring Rey far from this planet, because she had a strenuous childhood as it was. There was no reason to add any more pressure for her. Because Lando was, well, Lando, he was well acquired with stories, tales, adventures, and joys for Rey. Due to him being familiar with Chandrilla, he was able to treat Rey like his own daughter. The tragedy for Lando is part of this became synonymous with the guilt he had over not being able to be there for his own daughter. Yes, Lando did want to be out searching for Kadara, but the truth is, he couldn't be. He had spent the last eight years searching for her, and the emotional burden was too much to bear. It was Luke who suggested he stay behind with Rey, because it would help heal something within him that he lost. Luke promised to search for his daughter while he was gone. Though these journeys for Luke, Miramar, and sometimes other allies would constantly result in shortfalls. The biggest issue for them was the fact that the dagger was broken. The dagger itself was ancient, but it was reformed following the destruction of the second Death Star. In its restructuring, it fit the outline of the Emperor's throne room on Kef Burr. Luke couldn't find it because the coordinates needed didn't tell him anything. Due to their extra time, he was able to figure out how to read what was on the dagger, but still, without the whole blade, it was difficult. This led to years passing by several trips taking place over these years as the galaxy continued to change around them. It took until 25 BBY, three years before Ben could be fully corrupted, for Luke to find the location of the second Death Star, leading him to the Sith Wayfinder, and eventually where he would bring his twin sister and Ezra with him on a journey to finally destroy the Sith. While his confrontation with Palpatine would be short-lived, it'd be in his massive discovery of Exegol that the three Jedi would be in awe of what the former Empire was capable of, Despite setting the chain reaction off that would ravage the Final Order fleet, there was still more that came before. The formation of the First Order was done under the will of Snoke, and it was happening in the Unknown Regions, somewhere. Initially, the New Republic had no reason to fear the Imperial Remnant. If Leia hadn't been there, the following would have been impossible. Leia's seat inside the Senate still remained, and Chancellor Mon Mothma hadn't left her post fully. She'd become ill in recent months forcing the Republic to call for her retirement. No one disliked her, mostly, but her place as savior of the Republic would forever be remembered. Mothma's drive kept her in a position of power, so that she could be the first person to see Leia's evidence following Exegol. There was video proof, thanks to R2 accompanying them to the site. With visual confirmation of what the three Jedi saw, the New Republic was forced to sign a military expansion bill that would temporarily fund the recreation of an Alliance-sized fleet one not seen in over a decade. All the political squabbling eventually led to the creation of the largest New Republic fleet seen in its very short history. It would eclipse the size of the Alliance fleet post-Endor and pre-Jakku, but that again wasn't saying a whole lot. With movement coming from the New Republic, Luke would settle down into Osis and continue training his students. While it was known to many that Rey was a Palpatine, and that she was destined to become a powerful Jedi, they decided to not begin her training. As proven by Luke, Ben, and Anakin, Jedi can be trained far beyond the age of the traditional Order's code. In the years since finding her home with Lando, she adopted traits very similar to her father figure. Rey had found acceptance with him and his closest friends. While Miramar always returned home after a couple of months up until the discovery of Exegol, Rey mimicked a lot of what Lando did. They would work on the Lady Luck together, he would teach her useful skills, like how to work on a ship, how to balance a checkbook, how to talk your way out of any situation, and even how to win at Sabak. Rey loved going to local cantinas on Chandrulia to play Sabak, because she was one of those kids who just had that luck. Similar to Omega with the Dark, Rey was really pretty good at the game, but she also did learn from one of the best. After Exegol, Rey and Lando would temporarily part Rey's. Aside from the New Republic building up their military, there were some documents that Leia had found on Exegol. 
there was a project under the command of Brendel Hux, the same Imperial officer who had oversight on Project Necromancer. He presided over Project Resurrection as well, and despite Necromancer and Resurrection being similar in definition, one was for the Emperor and one was for an army. Being that the First Order didn't want to repeat flaws of the Old Republic, they elected to go with a different route. Using clones could have led to complications. Many officers of the First Order weren't really old enough to see the Clone War, and even if they were, they knew the clones were ousted for a reason, and that's all that really mattered to them. Using civilians wasn't really worth it, as proven by the Coruscant Civil War and mutinies following Operation Cinder. Brendel therefore came up with Project Resurrection. The First Order harvested children from the galaxy and trained them as stormtroopers, preparing them for real combat against the New Republic. Lando knew for a fact that his daughter had to have been captured, so he set out with the New Republic fleet to find her and stop the First Order. Ray understood why he was leaving, and it was also good timing. Luke wasn't joining the Republic on their mission. He instead was preparing to see his first knight become a master. With the voice of Vader and Snoke vanishing from his mind temporarily, Ben was able to focus in on what made him a successful Jedi. Miramar had a successful life ahead of her on Chandrilia, thanks to Leia, and because she wanted such successes for her daughter, she let Rey make her own choice. Like Ben, Rey chose the Jedi path. It was one of those defining attributes of Luke's order, choice. It was something taken for granted and forgotten about prior to the Clone War for the former order. Now, in this new era, those who were offered a chance to become a Jedi had the ability to choose. Rey's time with Lando and Han inspired this. Han formed a strong connection with Rey too, because like Lando, he missed his own child. Han was never going to forgo his attachment to Ben because he loved him to death, but he also wasn't going to stop his son from becoming a Jedi, because it's what Ben wanted. There were also some varying connection issues between father and son. Leia was able to match what Ben needed more evenly, whereas Han and Ben were just like each other, which kind of led to a clashing of how they expressed their love and care for the other. Rey struggled with the loss of Dathan, but by having Han and Lando around her, she found completion and wholeness. It was through Lando and Han that Rey decided to become a Jedi, because they talked about their adventures with Luke during the war and after it. At 10 years old, like Ben, Rey would join Luke's Jedi Order on Osis. Luke was semi-cautious about Rey's training. It was very clear to Leia, Ezra, and Luke that Rey was Palpatine's granddaughter. She just didn't know that truth yet. Miramar decided it'd be best for such truths to be kept hidden, as there was no reason to stress her out about it. Luke thought it was wrong to lie about her lineage, but there was so much to comprehend, even he understood that and putting the burden of being related to the most evil man in the galaxy on a 10 year old wasn't exactly the greatest thing to do. Luke just promised himself that he would oversee her training no matter what. Outside of the training grounds on Osis, the New Republic would traverse into the unknown regions for years. Similar to the hunt for Exegol, the First Order knew how to hide itself. Starkiller base was protected, but the forces protecting it were also hidden as well. The First Order fleet was permitted the chance to build in secrecy, and with the New Republic hunting them, it became the inverse of the fight between Rebellion and Empire. The New Republic kept finding hidden bases, but they were all abandoned by the time they got there. Despite the Republic being the dominant government in the galaxy, and even having the mandated new military under their control, they were still relatively inexperienced. These troopers, deckhands, and officers were all academy brats, none of them seeing combat except for the select few who still served following the Galactic Civil War and of course those stationed in and around the Outer Rim. The Republic forces avoided conflict unintentionally with the First Order for six more years, until 31 ABY, war hit the galaxy again. There were skirmishes throughout these years, but the First Order, thanks to Snoke, was able to mislead the Republic. The entire reason for this was so they could finish building Starkiller, which they didn't hear. Snoke knew that without a fully functional military power to stand up to the strength of the New Republic, they would never stand a chance. Most of the children from Project Resurrection were also teens when the Republic first entered the Unknown Regions, so it was imperative for them to wait, because they wouldn't have the sheer manpower to compete with Republic forces. The chip on the shoulder of these former Imperials, especially those still loyal after Operation Cinder, could not be overstated, and it was at the first sign of conflict the New Republic fleet would get swept. They didn't stand a chance because their overconfident approach got them obliterated. Granted, the leader of the operation was one of those Academy Freedom Fighters, 
They didn't really have the experience of Akbar, Sandula, or Argana. It was after this loss that pushed Admiral Akbar to the front lines. He had been out in the unknown regions, but more so as a moral support. He wasn't too present for any skirmishes, and he had held a position of influence over military troop movements in the Outer Rim and unknown regions. Instead of an individual fleet, he was maneuvering all the other important pieces on the board too. With the first battle a decisive loss, that all had to change. On Osis, the Jedi continued to grow. Master Solo was instructing a youngling at the moment, as the current Grand Master continued to oversee Rey's development. Ben was a great Jedi, and as Snoke's voice faded from his mind, Ben was able to release all of his darkened binds. He also repaired some of his relationship with his father, which helped him keep himself in the light. Rey's training was going really well though. Aside from being a descendant of Palpatine's, she was uplifted by two key factors. The Jedi had learned that she and Ben shared a diet in the Force, enhancing her knowledge with what Ben had learned. The two of them were really good friends, and this friendship helped grow her understanding of the Force altogether. The second, and truthfully, largest key to her success as a Jedi was her desire to learn. Many Jedi, especially with such raw talent, refused to do that. Anakin was standoffish with Obi-Wan, Luke was more focused on being a hero, and while Ben was more focused than either of them, Rey was dedicated to the Jedi path with all of her heart. Her attachment still rang strong, but she wanted to learn. Her mind absorbed every piece of information she could. Because there was no restricted section in Luke's archives, Rey would spend hours reading over books, holocrons, and data Luke had collected following the collapse of the Empire. She was obsessed, and Luke saw no reason to stop her from her desire to learn. It was through this that she excelled beyond even what Luke anticipated for her. He kept a close eye on this continuing growth. The darkness of her grandfather resided within her, and Luke almost, not fully, but almost feared that she could show signs of that Palpatine blood. This excitement to learn, of course, had its shortfalls, but they were very limited, and Luke never minded having a student always excited to learn. The temple life was very nice for everyone out in Osis, even for those who came to join the Order. Luke's new Jedi grew, and he was elated to see the continuous positive growth, though there was an inkling of fear. There were requests for the Jedi to involve themselves in the Unknown Regions conflict, and he rejected it, the reason being that he feared the Jedi being a part of another political conflict, when their religious and moral values should prevail over their personal political stances. The Jedi needed to be themselves without interjecting in the conflict. Luke was always around to help but this was the duty of the New Republic to stand tall in their most desperate hour. If the Jedi moved in to save them, then it could redefine who the Jedi were in this new era. Though because Luke never got involved, it gave room for Boken Jedi like Ezra and Jason to be involved. Some former Order 66 survivors would assist too, but it wouldn't be a collective representation from the new Jedi Order, which was fine. The First Order Uprising would take several months and thousands of casualties to resolve, but it would be an Admiral Akbar's final victory over Starkiller that would prove to Luke that their lack of involvement was rightly done. It was a three-part assault. The first leg started with a bulk fleet arriving outside of Ilum. The defenses of the unfinished planetary weapon were far too strong, so they used their position to knock out the Star Destroyers in the perimeter. These were both classic models and resurgent variants too. The second leg came with a Vice Admiral Holdout counter to the inevitable arrival of the First Order counter. It was a backside attack, and the First Order had nothing to protect themselves with. The third step was a commando array led by General Solo and Calrissian, where they hyperspaced themselves into the surface and lowered the shields. Despite the planet being a weapon, the cruelty displayed towards victims of Project Resurrection wouldn't be replicated by the Republic. The full-blown ground battle, a siege that would last for about a week, would be purposeful to save indoctrinated children from the First Order. It kind of worked, but it also kind of didn't. The First Order was brutal, so many troopers died for their dead empire, though the third part of this attack was worth every moment, because those saved had a chance to reunify with their families. This did luckily for Lando, include him reuniting with his long lost daughter, and Luke gaining a new member to his order. Snoke himself was never seen dead, but he was killed during the second leg of the assault. Vice Admiral Holdo's counter included an attack from the Ghost, with a new pilot, the captain being Jason Sandula, with his mom co-piloting, and Ezra on the guns. The Supreme Leader would be killed in the blast targeting the bridge. The First Order caused a massive political disruption to the Republic, but they were able to rally around their leadership. By this point, Leia had been forced to resign due to her lineage to Vader, but following the victory in the Unknown Regions, 
she was able to return and even find success in a new level of government. The largest challenge that the Republic faced was their unification with the unknown regions and the reunion between families who lost their loved children to Project Resurrection. Imperial loyalists were properly dealt with, humanely because the New Republic would never stoop to Imperial levels. Luke's Jedi Order would prosper due to his decision to keep them away from the conflict. The new Knights of the Galaxy would have huge shoes to fill, but they would be set. Luke had done his job, and while Snoke's death was never caused by Luke's own actions, it would be in his disappearance that the new Jedi could learn to counter rising dark religions. The galaxy was huge, as was seen with Ochi and Kaiza, darkness resides by those harmed by the Sith Way. It was up to the Order to transcend the darkness and rise above it. Rey's bond with Lando would remain father and daughter. Maybe they weren't related by blood, but they were family. Lando always called her his second daughter, and her empty last name, one that was revealed to be Palpatine, was left for her to decide. She'd pick Calrissian, because found family, no matter what, is still family. Rey and Kadara would become great friends and even consider themselves sisters in the years coming. Of course, Rey was understanding of Lando's focus on Kadara's health, as she reintegrated into the Republic, after being tormented by the First Order. This was common for families across the galaxy. Rey would continue to train with her fellow brothers and sisters within the Jedi Order, and she would assist Luke in finding more relics of the past. This did include from both light and dark, but it would be through her obsession with training and learning that she would reveal the path to Tantalor, a location that would open up many new possibilities for the growing Order. Before the end of Luke's life, the Order would reach a stunning 100 members, making all of his dedicated work worth it. And despite Grogu choosing to reject the Jedi earlier, he would come back to find solidarity with it. Gunji too would be one of those Jedi that returned to the Order. The old guard would continue to slip away, into the Force, but their sacrifices would be forever remembered. The new generation of Jedi would never have a Grand Master again, believing that that title should be reserved for Luke and Luke alone, being that he resurrected their order from the ground up. Instead of Grand Masters or Counselors, there were Guardians and Elders, Ben being one of the Elders, and his other half of the Dyad, Rey Calrissian, being Guardian of Wisdom. All of her obsession with learning would prove to be incredibly important for the next generation of Jedi. While yes, the Republic would fluctuate, the Jedi, thanks to Luke, and the new generation would have their path carved out for them in prosperity. And, and that, that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to all of our patrons. Andrew Wells, Darth Maelstrom, Ozpin, Darth Vitiate, Seiju Jagger, Root36, Hunter Belden, Rosebird, Angel Dust, Alexander Reese, The Beginning and End, Django Fett Clone, Nick5098, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tib, CC2024, Galva Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Granite D. Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Colin Rooney, Shark McDory, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlinger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was 70, Annika Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Deguin, Seth Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. E Gamer, Lord Cali, Yelling Slayer 66, Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Fortis Lakes of Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, Mammoth Two First Names, Dark Sea 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing. Force Born Channel, smash that like button. Go check out the giveaway down below, three Star Destroyers, Patreon giveaway on the Patreon. Let's talk about this story. So the theme of Rey consistently is found family, and that's something I needed to have here. It just had to be here. Uh, her finding found family with Lando makes a lot of sense. All of this story originates from the book Shadow of the Sith. It's a really good book. I really enjoyed it. It's a great story involving Rey, Luke, and Lando, and how they almost intersect several times leading up to how everything sets up for Rise of Skywalker. I think it's a really good precursor to not just that, but what the sequels are. Luke finding Exegol happens because he has the dagger. He doesn't have it in the sequels because it's lost on Basana where Oji crashed his ship and died in the Black Sands. So giving him a chance to kind of really work hard to find it through using half the dagger that still remains is why he, Ezra, and Leia are able to go to x -Gol and finish the fight. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.